welcome to my sewing room. Oh, we have so much fun for you today. Now, the real theme of the show is having fun with built-in embroidery stitches. This little doll is so sweet in a little smock dress, and guess what? Her face is built in embroidery. You just simply press a button and you get her face. Now then, this funny little clown, I just love that long nose, is another one of the little faces. You just simply press an embroidery machine and the face comes out. I bet some of you thought that faces, doll faces, were limited only to doll's faces. Well, I think not. This is one of the cutest jackets with doll faces quilted in and embroidered all over the jacket. Isn't that a fun, happy jacket? Little pinafores can come with embroidery. This one is one of my designs to go in the embroidery machine. You know, you can get ideas for how to make real fashion things out of all, from all kinds of sources. Here is a picture from a famous fashion magazine with the idea of, of embroidery on the collar, and then you use your embroidery machines and simply embroider the collar of either a blouse you make or one that you purchase. Now, cut work is going to be a real theme for today. Cut work does not have to be done just on linen, as some people might think. This is a cut work design, built-in embroidery design, done on silk. Here is another cut work, built-in embroidery design, done on wool. And you see the lining just peeks through after it's cut through. Here is another cut work embroidery design right out of the machine on wool, and this one is reversible. The last jacket I have to share with you is cut work done on velvet with these wonderful little applique flowers. Here to be my guest today is my very dear friend Sue Hausman, Vice President of Education for Husqvarna Viking. And now Sue will introduce you to cut work by machine on the technique boards. Thank you, Martha. Thanks for inviting me back. And today I've brought a technique called cut work. And first, I'd like to share how to do it on any sewing machine that has a zigzag. It's very basic technique, really, that was done first by nuns back in the 17th century. And here on our board, you see a beautiful table runner and napkin. And you can see the actual cutout behind the fabric. Now you would begin by cutting a square of linen the size you'd like and you'd trace the cutwork design onto that piece of linen or heavyweight cotton with one of the fabric marking pens that can be removed by water. Now I usually like to take the fusible paper stabilizer and put it on and fuse it on underneath the area that will be sewn before I actually mark it because as we know sometimes that heat of fusing can set those markings. Once you have it marked and stabilized, it's time to go to the sewing machine and straight stitch around all of the guidelines of the design, and in this case, a scallop around the napkin and the table runner that my machine does automatically. You may want to draw that on if you don't have that option. Once you've straight stitched, trim close to the straight stitching. Sometimes I straight stitch twice to stabilize. Cut out the holes where you would like the cut work to be. Then fuse a couple of layers of water soluble stabilizer and put it underneath and satin stitch around the edge. Now we're going to go to the sewing machine and Martha's waiting for us to show just how to do that satin stitching. Hi Martha. Hi Sue. This is so exciting. <laughs> well, I'm really ready. Thanks for inviting me again to Thank share you this. Being here. Thanks. And I will say that I think sometimes it's easier for beginners to start with a simple shape like the little uh, eyes we have here and make a little flower rather than that complicated design you know on the table runner napkin <laughs> and so the first step would be to trace it and I use a water paper uh, a water soluble pen or even in this case a marking pen because you're going to do it onto the fusible stabilizer then fuse the stabilizer behind your fabric and once you've done that you can see that you can see the design through go to the sewing machine and I'm set up with straight stitch and I'm going to actually start in the center of one side I'll select a straight stitch a little shorter stitch length than normal and stitch around that shape and of course if you have your needle stop down that will help you stop at those points and what I like to do is to stitch around it a couple of times now I'm not going perfectly straight but you know what the beauty of this Martha <laughs> you don't have to go around it perfectly straight but we would continue to stitch around a couple of times and then once we had done that we would be ready to do the cutting and in this case you're going to stick your uh, scissors underneath and you can either cut through to the stabilizer or you can cut 
uh, this carefully without cutting the stabilizer, I'm going to put a piece of net under here. So in that case, I would have to cut the stabilizer away as well. And I don't want the paper stabilizer under there necessarily during the next step. So once you've cut that out, I've actually taken the time to do it here on another sample. See oh, how right. my finger okay. peeks through? <laughs> stabilizer and every, every, fabric right? was, and stabilizer was cut away. If you wanted to put some net under, that would be the time to do it, okay? But in this case, I think I just would like to share how to do the cut work satin stitch. So I'll put a piece of the water-soluble stabilizer underneath, go back to the machine. I'm using my see-through foot, which I think is the best choice because it lets you see better what you're doing and you have that little red line as the guideline. Select a satin stitch and then simply satin stitch around the design, stitching off the edge. And of course, this is usually done tone-on-tone -tone color-wise, Martha, not with green and red thread. <laughs> as you approach a corner you, or a point, you might want to narrow your width down and sew out to that point then pivot and come back on the other side. But basically, that is the way the cut work is done when you're doing it manually. You would simply go all the way around the outside edge, and you could add the bars of Richelieu, but would you like to see an easier way? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I we thought, like the word easy. <laughs> I thought you would. And the truth is that today, with the embroidery machines, you have the choice of just picking out a cut work design and then simply telling your machine. Now, one of the neat things in the last few years is that the embroidery machines have become much more affordable for people and the options have become greater and greater and greater. And so I've snapped on my embroidery foot, I'm dropping my feed teeth, it's this easy, turn on the embroidery and I'm ready to sew by sliding on my hoop. I'm actually doing a big plus hoop design this time. So select your stitch, in this case number four, and tell the machine I want to sew and go. Now, the neat thing is, I don't know if you noticed, I don't even have to put my presser foot, uh, my foot on the presser foot. It's, by the way, it stops and tells me when to cut the thread. <laughs> and now I go. And remember that first step we did where we stitched around the embroidery? Absolutely. What do you think? Well, it looks like the machine. You don't even have your foot on no. the pedal. <laughs> don't even have my foot on the pedal. I could be doing the dishes while it's doing that step. It'll stop automatically. I can remove it as far as I'd like from the machine and just slide the hoop is, is what I usually do. Slide it off. I could go to a flat surface. I generally sew a lot of these at one time and then come back and do the trimming. But today, in the essence of time, we're going to just sew one. And what we would do then would be to trim real closely to that stitching. And here again, uh, that's easy to do with a good scissors. This is a really heavy linen. I don't know if you noticed it. It's actually easier to do if you get this off and get it in your lap to work with it. But I'm not trimming the stabilizer underneath. It's in the hoop. Truth is, if I cut it by mistake, it's not a big deal. What I'll do is just put another piece underneath and it's that easy. Now, slide it back on once you've done all your trimming and you see that little piece in there, which isn't, isn't such a hot idea to have that piece there. And then the simple step of, again, whoop, I forgot to put the presser foot down. Oh, it but don't worry, me. it told me. It beeped, <laughs> and there was a little presser foot beeping at me, and it said, put the presser foot down before you start to sew, Sue. And here again, telling me when to stop and cut those threads. And I don't know if you noticed that it's actually stitching across the center of this now. That is actually creating the stabilizing lines for what we call Richelieu bars, the bars that sew in the air. And uh, it's a French word, and you'll see that it's stitching right across the center of that opening, of the teardrop opening, and now it's stitching a satin stitch over that stabilizing stitch of the bar. And then it's going to go ahead and finish it up for me while I do whatever I want to do. I think this is absolutely fascinating. So much fun and so easy, and you really could be washing the dishes because you're not doing anything. <laughs> no, you're, well, I do that. You know, I load the washer, I do other things. Okay, now it's ready to start doing my satin stitch around the edge. It's actually, if you notice, done one more row of that stabilizing straight stitch. And of course, the important thing about that is that's what keeps your cut work holding its shape through washings and keeps those edges from fraying out. And I probably could have trimmed a little more carefully and a little more uh, closely, but I was really rushing for the camera so that we could get done with that. And I do have some finished step-by-steps here, of course, that I can share where we've actually gone and completed the design. The design is completed in the same way, Martha. I just touched the button, and that's all there is to finishing that design. What do you think? Oh, I, I think it's fabulous. Isn't fabulous it? and fun. <laughs> Isn't it fun? It's so quick. And so here you see an example, then, of doing the whole rest of the design and then of the one plus hoop section and then adding the other sections 
and you can do table runners, you can do all kinds of beautiful things. Here's a real pretty table runner that's been created with several of those same designs. So, what do you, th you were well, you ready to do it? You know what, I, I have done it and I do think it's wonderful and that is such you know, it could almost have been done by hand. You look at it, mm -hmm. you move it away about two inches and it looks exactly like handwork, and I like that. It does. Now, Sue has a really nice home decorating project for you. This is the most beautiful embroidered curtain, Sue. <laughs> Thanks, Martha. I'm really excited about this. You know, often you have a window in a kitchen or a bathroom where you have no view or, or no view you want to look at, or in the reverse, in a bathroom, you don't want people to be able to view in. So this is a solid curtain that actually will let the light in and yet be beautiful in the window. And it's so easy for the beginners. You'll notice the embroidery around the top comes to a V point with the scallop stitching. And then do you recognize our cutwork design down do. here that we were just working on? <laughs> I do. And the scallops along the bottom. Now the great part is you only have to measure the window. Let's show everybody. Okay. Pull out that one pin. You only have to measure the width of the window and the length of the window and then how much drop do you want. This one's about 15 inches at the point, but you could cut a long strip of fabric and hang it over your curtain rod and play around with it until you had okay. what you want. So do you see that this is one strip of fabric? And just remember one thing, the right side is here on this part of it, and then the right side is on the wrong side on this part of it. Plop it over your curtain rod, maybe top stitch here or just tack a couple times and you'll have a beautiful curtain. What do you oh, think? Oh, I think it is real, and it's just so heirloomy too. I just love it. I just love it. Well, the little scallops, I have a tip for your viewers on the scallops. You know, those you're going to cut after you sew them. And what I've really found makes it easy is to take one of the fray stopping type liquids okay. and to not, you have to be careful about this stuff. It can mark your, your fabric, but to work outside the scallop and don't, not to get it real close. Now you can do it with a toothpick if this one's really cut with a wide open hole. But you notice I'm not coming right up to the scallop, but look what's happening. It actually wicks up to the thread. Oh so goodness. if you run it outside the scallop and then what it will do, it'll actually work its way up. It, the fabric will wick it right up to the thread. Let it get very, very dry before you cut and then come back in with a really sharp scissors and cut close but of course not too close cutting those threads but I think the wicking of that phrased out liquid is something people have enjoyed oh wow <laughs> and that just gives you a little bit it makes it a little bit easier too I think I brought a couple more samples I really would like to show how you how much um, fun one of them is this idea if you take a look at these little grapes and I'm gonna dash down and pick this up because this is the eyelet plate and these are actually little eyelets so Fascinating. If, you, if you have an eyelet on your sewing machine you can make cutwork grapes Oh, cut work grapes, I love it. <laughs> and don't be afraid of t-shirts. Now, my sister is not a sewer. She got one of our new embroidery machines for Christmas, and she's going crazy. She made me this t-shirt. Yes. Just, uh, well, that's a store-bought shirt, then. It is a store-bought <laughs> shirt with cut work, and then she's put a hem stitch with the wing needle. So, I hate to say this, but the cheaper t-shirts work better because oh, they're, they're kind of oh, goodness me. So, that's a kind of fun one. And how about a little tea cozy? This is another one of those pre-programmed cut work designs. There's a little tea cozy to put over the teapot, and here's the little table mats that go with it. There's actually two here, but you can see the little cut work design. That's a touch the button one. You know, on and that's the, the kind I like. Yep. <laughs> and cut work's not limited to uh, table linens and things. Here's a tote bag, and it's vinyl lined. And remember when I put the netting behind? I do. Well, in this case, we would put vinyl behind the whole bag so that it's waterproof on the inside, and that vinyl peeks through so that you have a little peek through to what's in your purse. Or how about a shoe bag? Isn't that fun? And you, you know, a sh do you have vinyl behind that one also? I do, so you can see shoe the shoes. Shoe bags are really nice things mm -hmm. to have for those of us that travel all the time. Last quick one. This is our little uh, pillow for all seasons. Make it for someone as a gift. There's our cut work design on it, but then when it's their birthday, send them a happy birthday button on, send them a Christmas button on. They'll know you're thinking about them all year long. That is fascinating. <laughs> so thank you so much. And I want to tell you how much I enjoy watching your television show oh, for public broadcasting, also America So. Thank you, Martha. Oh my goodness, haven't we had fun? And now I have a really neat craft for you.
wonder how many of you watching today could think of maybe a creamer that you have in your cupboard that nothing else matches, or maybe a, a sugar bowl, or maybe you were in an antique store and, and there was this pretty little creamer, but you really couldn't use it for anything well. I'll tell you, we have a project today, very easy to do, that shows you how to make something wonderful out of those mismatched sugars and creamers. We call this a nosegay bouquet. Now I'm going to kind of lift this little embellishment out to let you see that this is a little uh, creamer pitcher purchased at an antique store. I think it was for $5.50 because it didn't match anything. It may even have a little chip somewhere. But anyway, we made this little embellishment to go in it. It is a very sweet little Victorian uh, home decorating item. Okay, now first of all, let's see how easy and I mean this is easy to make. Okay, go ahead and get yourself a few little flowers. You can put them together and some leaves, whatever you want to. Now this is the, what the finished bouquet looks like. Then take some florist tape, wrap it around. Of course, you're gonna need to make it a little bit bigger. Just wrap it and stretch it around it. And then whatever little goodies you have, we've actually gotten a little crocheted doily here. I'm gonna stick it down in the middle, wrap the doily up around it. And you know, if you want to, you can even take these little leaves and stick them through one of these little uh, crochet doily holes right there and make it hold all the way around for a little bouquet. You can even tie a little bit of lace around there. However you want to do it is really great. And then once you get your little bouquet ready, this little bouquet is a really cute one too. You can either just place it in your creamer or you can choose to hot glue gun it. Now then we have a really neat doll dress for you. Machine embroidery is absolutely precious on doll dresses too. My pretty little doll has on a white batiste dress. Do you see that wonderful machine embroidery around her collar? And this really neat full skirt that I love so much has machine embroidery running down where it's been divided up into gores all up and down the skirt. And by the way, that is an entredeau stitch that has been used to attach the gathered uh, French edging along either side of the machine embroidery. The same treatment is used on her little sleeve. The machine embroidery with gathered French lace edging on either side attached with wing needle entredeau. Now what is wing needle entredeau? I'll show you in just a minute. But it's called entredeau, entredeau, entredeur. And one lady in California said, Martha, I just love that entredux on clothing. So you call it anything you want to, it's still very beautiful. And by the way, it's really hem stitching. Now then, how do you make that beautiful dress? First of all, I'm going to draw off the gores. Right here is where I'm going to draw off the gores. And then I'm going to put a line where I'm going to do my machine embroidery on the skirt. Here is the machine embroidery, the first run down the sides, down the gores, and then here's my little, uh, the green leaf part of the machine embroidery on the skirt. Now I do have to use a stabilizer behind any type of machine embroidery. This is a paper one which tears away really easily. Now then, this uh, run of the embellishment has little pink flowers. I like to put flowers on it. Now then, after we finish all of the machine embroidery, it is then time to gather the French lace, butt it up to the line I've just drawn, and you can just zigzag it down, or you can uh, wing needle entredeau it down. This is after all of the zigzagging or wing needle entredeauing is done, it is then time to gather some French edging and butt it, or not butt it up, to overlap it on the bottom of the skirt and either zigzag it or wing needle entredeau it down. Let's review one time on the sleeve, which really is the same thing except as the skirt. First of all, I'm going to trace off the line, put some paper stabilizer behind it. Then I'm going to machine, do my machine work right up and down, be sure the stabilizer is still there. And then I'm going to gather the French lace and attach it with wing needle entredeau. Entredeau, entredux, entredeur, however you want to pronounce it, is good with me, any way is correct. I have a 100 wing needle, and this particular machine does have a wing needle stitch built into it. If you don't have a machine that has wing needle stitch and entredeau built into it, then you can just do you can just do a zigzag to attach your lace. But it is so much fun to be able to do the old fashioned turn of the century hem stitching, which is called wing needle entredeau. I think if you'll look right behind this foot, you can see how beautiful it is to attach the laces using a wing needle entredeau. Now, you know I do have a stabilizer underneath it because every time I use wing needle entredeau, I do have to use stabilizer. And it's really a beautiful stitch. 
Here is the little final sleeve after I've done wing needle entredeau to attach the lace, except this one is in blue and my little doll's dress is in white. You might want to, in the entredeau, take some silk ribbon, put it on a tapestry needle, and thread it up and down over, over one, under one, or else over two, under two, and that way you can have beading, uh, beading with ribbon for your little doll's dress. Next, I have a wonderful antique technique for you. This is a magnificent antique pillow which I purchased in Paris a couple of years ago. It has the most beautiful double ruffle that I think I've ever seen, and I don't believe I've ever seen a pillow exactly like it. You see, I lift up one layer of lace, and then there's another little ruffle, and then another beautiful layer of lace. And it reminds me of the uh, cut work that Sue did earlier, because here are eyelets, which sort of look like cut work, and then embroidery. Now, this is all done by hand, but you see, you could do it on the machine. Now, how do you do that double ruffle? Well, here we go. First of all, I have a piece of fabric for the ruffle, and in order to attach uh, lace to flat fabric, I move the lace in about a quarter of an inch. Now let me just show you how this is done. I move the lace in about a quarter of an inch, and then I zigzag with a pretty wide, as a matter of fact, I'm going to take this zigzag up even a little bit wider, just a regular zigzag. I put this on about a four width and a one length, and then it rolls and whips it in. I go zigzag, it goes over and it rolls and whips all of that excess fabric in and really makes a beautiful seam. It's a very tight seam also. Here's what it looks like when it's finished. You roll it over and then you open it up and that makes a beautiful seam which also does not come apart. The next layer, I've got to go ahead and put the second layer of lace on there. So I have a wide ruffle and I simply lay the next layer of lace down on top of it and straight stitch it down. Now this is gonna be a ruffle, so pretty sure we're gonna to have to have some gathering threads in there. So I run two rows of gathering threads, and then working with the bobbin threads, pull the gathers up and distribute them evenly around my pillow, and then I sew it actually to the pillow by laying the pillow over here, right sides to right sides, straight stitch, and I also might choose to go ahead and finish. You know what I could do? I could do this on the serger too, this final row. But I'm going to come in here straight stitch, then I'll trim the seam allowance down, and then I could just zigzag it to finish it, or I could serge it. And that would be the final construction needed, if you're going to do it on the machine, to make a lovely pillow like this to attach that double ruffle around the outside of the pillow. Won't you come along with me to my attic to see another beautiful antique? Sometimes simplicity is the absolute most beautiful of all. This blouse I call tucked elegant blouse and that's exactly what it is. The top features just a little collar, entredeau attaches it and look at the beautiful released tucks that's, that go high in the shoulder and then go down to a point in the middle. The sleeve also has just some beautiful tucks on it. This one has, let's see, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, one, two, three, four, five, six. So there's lots of creativity there on, on how many tucks there are on the sleeve. And then just a beautiful gathered lace at the bottom. As you know, many times the backs of these blouses around the turn of the century are just as beautiful as the front. And this blouse is no exception. The wonderful release tucks go all the way to the center in the back, and I think this back placket is pretty. There are even more tucks on a piece that forms the, black pack, the back placket, and this um, has the buttons in the buttonholes, and you can see some of my buttons are missing, but that's okay, that's the way I got it, and sometimes I don't even replace buttons, just to leave it where it's completely uh, as it was made. There are also some hooks in the back, which I find very interesting. These are big, heavy hooks, and they were used to put, these are the hooks and the eyes would be on the skirt, so you could hook your skirt into your blouse, and your blouse would not come out. And then, of course, there's a little tie there, too. Thank you so much for joining me in my sewing room today. I've had a lot of fun. I hope you'll join me next time.